everybody. Uh, mostly you're muted just to keep down the background noise. So if you want to speak, which we will do after Devarian has uh, given us his little talk on the, on the book, the very fascinating book that he's written, uh, we will open it up. Love In the meantime, if you want to ask any other questions, please feel free to put them in chat. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dottie and Dottie, I'll take care of letting people in while you do the introductions. Okay, great. So, so we're pleased, most pleased this evening to have Devarian L. Baldwin with us. One who gave you the, the, the keyboard and Where? Dottie Jeffries. Well, I don't see her. How do I turn it? Yeah. She, she was the one who was on the screen. Oh. Michael, I'm, I'm getting some background. What? This is okay. Dottie Jeffries. Yeah. I'm not on mute. I'm getting, well, okay. So, Carry on. Then, Michael? Yeah. Okay, I was getting some background noise. So, it's like, yeah, I'm trying it? to. Um, Shut okay. things down. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So Devarian's a leading urbanist, historian, and cultural critic. He currently serves as the Paul E. Rather, Distinguished Professor of American Studies, and is a founding director of the Smart Cities Lab at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. Baldwin also serves on the Executive Committee of Scholars for Social Justice. His opinions and commentaries have been featured in numerous outlets, including NBC News, PBS, the History Channel, USA Today, The Washington Post, and Time. Devarian is also the author of Chicago's New Negroes, Modernity, The Great Migration, and Black Urban Life, which was published in 2007, as well as many um, essays and scholarly art articles. His work largely examines the landscape of global cities through the lens of the African diasporic experience. Baldwin's related interests include universities and urban development, the racial foundations of academic thought, intellectual and mass culture, black radical thought and transnational social movements, and the politics of heritage, tourism and 20th and 21st century art, architecture and urban design. The Varian has a PhD and master's degree from New York University in American studies and he earned his BA from Marquette University. And <clears throat> Devarian is a native of Beloit, Wisconsin. So Devarian, welcome. And we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate this, this time, this, this evening to spend with you all in Hyde Park, uh, a place I consider the South Side more broadly a home away from home. I have family there, spent summers there. If I, like I was saying earlier, if I wasn't in, in, uh, in the South of Mississippi where my family family is originally from. I spent summers in Chicago. Um, so I, I, you know, it, it took me to move all the way to New York to come back and study in Chicago with over 25 years of scholarship. So here I am again, and I'm happy to be here. Um, as I said before, so much of my work begins with Chicago. And this book, In the Shadow of the Abbey Tower, is no different. So I'm going to read a couple passages for you from the very beginning of the book, just to set the tone about what was at stake and what I was trying to think about and where, where the, what was, this, these few passages also kind of give you a sense of where the book came from in a very real way. So the introduction is called Chess Moves on a Checkerboard. I never thought a university would foretell the future of our cities. But there I was on December afternoon in 2003, stepping out into the brick south side air after hours hold away in the University of Chicago Regenstein Library. I immediately heard chants of protest and saw people buzzing about. So I followed the sound over to the main quadrangle, just outside the university's administration building. There I saw a crowd of about 50 people surrounded by media crews and onlookers. On one side stood residents from the historic black neighborhood of Bronzeville, alongside students and others chanting, U of C, look at your history, while holding signs that read support the checkerboard lounge in Bronzeville. And on the other side, university officials listened, mostly playing defense with a silent chorus of furrowed brows. 
The famed checkerboard lounge had been a cultural mainstay of Bronzeville, yeah. a blue shrine that stood on 43rd Street since 1972. The lounge needed restoring, but instead of providing the funding, the university put together a plan to relocate the lounge from its original spot to a university-owned building inside the Hyde Park neighborhood's Harper Court Shopping District. Outraged, restoring Bronzeville advocates immediately charged U Chicago with cultural piracy. For decades, the city had turned its back on Bronzeville, but things were slowly changing, largely because of the sweat equity of local advocates working to turn things around. Renovated 100-year-old brownstones, newly built condominiums, developments, and small shops began to slowly fill in the spaces between vacant lots and run down storefronts. And many saw the checkerboard lounge as central to the economic revitalization of Bronzeville as a heritage tourism destination. But just when momentum started building around a modest neighborhood comeback, the university swept in and bought up one of the area's best cultural assets. And U Chicago's backdoor deal resuscitated almost a century of local stories in which the school had either demolished black neighborhood blocks or built institutional walls to keep black residents away from campus. Here we go again, activist thought. And so that's just like the first three paragraphs from the beginning of In the Shadow of the Ivy Tower. Um, it's important because as I was saying earlier, suggesting earlier is that the first uh, 20 years of my, of my academic career, I went to, to New York City and most academics, they study where they, they study where they are, where they receive their PhD. But I did it the hard way. I went to New York and realized that New York doesn't explain the experience that I want to tell. I had to go home. And the place that was home to me in a big way was a city like Chicago. And so oh, it, 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 it was quite apropos that I was in the uh, Regenstein Library doing archival research for a, a totally different project that still is yet to come. <laughs> um, and when I stepped outside of the library, there was history hitting me right in the face. And so I filed the chance. And as you, as you heard in the, in the first three paragraphs, um, I did what academics do. I conducted research and found out that this, you know, acquisition of the Checkerboard Lounge and relocation to Hyde Park was pretty historic, but it was just the beginning. It was the tip of the iceberg. And as I began to talk to people, they were like, you know, well, you know, wait, wait a minute. This is just the beginning of the story that that you Chicago has in many ways controlled the south side of Chicago since its foundations in 1892 for over 100 years. And that not only do does high, does U Chicago have a firm hand on uh, commercial real estate, but it also controls uh, low wage labor, employment, um, health care, and probably most alarmingly, it, it controls policing um, on the South Side in ways that people thought was unprecedented. But as I began to talk to people and tell them the story, as I was trying to figure out whether I had a story here that was bigger than just Chicago, they were like, wait a minute, you got to talk about NYU and Columbia, New York and USC and South Central and, uh, you know, uh, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut and uh, St. Louis University and Washington University in St. Louis in St. Louis and Emory in Atlanta and UPenn in West Philadelphia and, Saint, and uh, Johns Hopkins in, in East Baltimore and, and University of Miami and Coral Gables. And the story just really began to take on a life of its own. That I began to realize that right before our eyes, um, colleges and universities have become the biggest employers, real estate holders, healthcare providers, and policing agents in both big cities and small towns all across the country. And that this was a story that needed to be told. And as I say at the end of the book, the, the ivory tower is dead, that these institutions are not elevated and above and disconnected from everyday life, but they're firmly embedded in our lives. And they have impacts in our lives in ways that we have yet to fully engage and understand. And this book is where I wanted to tell that story. 
some people have seen it as primarily a story about higher education, but it really is a story about cities. What, to what degree have these institutions had such a strong impact on our cities in ways that we have yet to fully understand and continue to do so? It's that, it's that these, these, these institutions, that with the, with the fall of the house of factories, as we enter this, what people call um, this deindustrialized age, where factories have moved to the global south, they haven't gone away because we still have you know, finished goods. We all still have clothing on our backs and processed food. So factories are still around, but they are less visible. So with the displacement of factories to the, to the global south, um, and today, and what we, today what we call the, the, the service economy or the knowledge economy, um, what does it mean that colleges and universities are setting land values, are dictating the terms of healthcare standards, um, are controlling and setting the wage ceiling for low wage workers and are dictating the policing standards, not just for students and faculty, but for entire cities. And so this is the story that I wanted to tell. And I knew that I couldn't tell that story um, with just simply from the perspective of those who worked on campus that when we consider the broad reach of these institutions, the best way to tell this story is from those who actually live it, those who endure it, those who um, are the objects of this university expansion, those who live in the shadows of ivory towers. So it's those who live in the surrounding neighborhoods, those who come to work in the cafeterias, and on the grounds crew. Those young people who are profiled by campus police. Um, those labor activists who work with those cafeteria workers and groundskeeper workers to ask for, to demand living wages. Those uh, kind of invisible staff members who support the various institutions on campus but are rarely seen and heard. And then those everyday residents who surround the campuses, whose lives are impacted in ways that we've yet to fully understand and recognize. And so this, 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 this book was an important departure for me because most of my work had primarily been historical. And, uh, but I was trained in American studies in a very interdisciplinary way. And so it allowed me to kind of work those muscles that I hadn't been using for a long time um, and I conducted over 125 interviews over a 15-year period in Phoenix, Arizona, in New York City, in Chicago, in Hartford, Connecticut, in Pittsburgh, in Philadelphia, in St. Louis, in uh, other places to tell this story. Um, someone has always said to me, a good colleague of mine at Trinity said to me, if you want to know what universities and colleges are teaching their students. Show me the condition of the neighborhoods that surround the campus. And so this is the response to that, that, that missive, that charge. What are the experiences? What are the conditions of the neighborhoods? Whether very, very good, but isolated and homogeneous or very, very bad and mixed and struggling the conditions of the neighborhoods tell the story of the university and their impacts on these cities. That we now live in a world, and Hyde Park is very much so a part of the story, where colleges and universities have gained a growing control, not over education, but over the economic development and the political governance of our urban lives, or what I call the rise of universities. And so some of you have been in Hyde Park for a long time, and I'd start with trying to begin with, well, how do we get here? How do we tell this story? Well, in the, uh, after, you know, decades of uh, white flight and uh, capital fleeing to the suburbs, um, by the time we get to the 90s, there becomes a reinvigorated interest in city life. The children, or dare I say the grandchildren of suburban sprawl, um, 
they turn back to the city after after being disaffected by the homogeneity, the boring nature of sprawl life in the suburbs. They want to turn back into the city. They we we, we see the, the the rise of what's what's called the back to the city movement, and I was a part of that. I moved from the Midwest to New York City in 1994, and uh, so I, I I lived this experience. So at the, as this was happening, you had city leaders on one side who were trying to figure out ways to capture the tax base of empty nesters and young professionals come back into the city. And on the other side, you had universities that were um, gaining less and less support from states and both public and private schools received money from the government. So they were receiving less money from the government to support higher education. So you had this moment of interest convergence between university leaders and city administrators that were looking at these returnees back to the city who had this idea of city life that was very much, um, you know, walkability, riverfront development, museums, coffee shops, lectures, uh, dense density, basically a campus. So city leaders and university administrators their interests converged and they began to impart, impart or embark on this process of turning more and more parts of the city into a campus. And so you see this in Hyde Park with the beginning retro, retrofitting of Harper Court. There had been years where you had older men and younger men playing chess out in front of the square. Um, you know, the, the, the shops were a little seedy. There was some graffiti on walls. It was very low, quote unquote, low rent. And then around 2000, 2001, you begin to see the upgrade of Harper Court, the upscaling of Harper Court until it comes to full fruition um, about seven to 10 years later. And while the shops were more diverse, the economic standards and the sea, the floor of the area was higher. And as I began to tell the story, I, I wrote a piece about this in, um, in uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education. And it was based on my, on my observations. But then one day I got a phone call from a, a, a University of Chicago administrator. And he said, you know, all the things you're speculating about, I can tell you from the inside that everything you're saying is true and more. And that gentleman, he became, um, through the pseudonym, Matthew, he becomes a central character in my chapter on Chicago to begin to tell the story of how the language of urban engagement was primarily a cover for you Chicago to gain greater control over the High Park neighborhood to turn it into a campus so that the university could be competitive with its peers on the East Coast like Yale, Hopkins, UPenn, Dartmouth, um, and other places. That the talk of urban engagement was really a cover and a foil um, to gain greater control over the High Park neighborhood without very little concern for the residents of the neighborhoods. And so this set me on a course to track the numbers, to follow the stories, to, to tell the stories. And I guess one of the biggest elements of the Chicago story that resonated with me and, and other, other people across the country that as, I, as I began to distribute this book is the story about policing. And as you all know, um, violence is real on the South Side. Violence is real in Chicago. Um, but the question becomes, if more and more you Chicago police is the answer. And as I began to look and conduct research and talk to people, early on, there was this very clear celebration, even in communities of color saying, thank gosh, we have more police that can help us. They can get here quicker than Chicago PD. But very quickly, as soon as UCPD gained a greater foothold into the surrounding blocks beyond the campus, there were serious grumblings to the point of protest around what's, what residents were calling racial profiling. That there was a clear understanding by many in, um, that because the campus students and faculty were predominantly white and the surrounding blocks 
um, they weren't even majority black, but were, were, were more black and brown than the campus, that those who were stopped at much greater rates, sometimes at 90%, as, as statistics reveal later, 90% of stops in Hyde Park by UCPD were African-Americans, even though they only made up uh, about 50% of the residency. So there was clear protests and considerations or concerns about racial profiling and what was being called a two-tier policing stu uh, system by student activists. That if a student and a resident were um, committing the same infraction and picked up by UCPD for the same infraction, the student would be sent to the Dean of Students while the resident, primarily black, primarily male, would be sent through the criminal justice system. And so it became very clear to me through study and research and conversation, what was public safety, how was public safety being understood in Hyde Park? Because if you look at the actual crimes on campus and campus should be the primary focus of campus police. And as you probably know, uh, University of Chicago Police has the biggest, the second biggest police force, private police force in the world outside of Vatican. So we're talking about a major private security force. And because it's a private university with, that's armed with jurisdiction wherever there is a University of Chicago uh, uh, building, we're talking about a private security force with public authority, with very little public oversight. So when we consider what are the major crimes on campus, because campus should be the primary focus of, of campus policing. It's substance abuse and sexual violence. U Chicago does a horrible job of policing those primary crimes. Now, some might say it's an issue of capacity. Well, they have the second biggest private security force in the world. So it would be difficult to say capacity. I've discovered that really the focus or the problem is intent. Because what campus wants to publicize to potential students and investors that they have a campus full of white criminals? So where are campus police? They're overrepresented in the surrounding neighborhoods to signal Devarian, I think you've frozen. Can you hear me? Oh, I think we lost Devarian. Okay, let's get him back in. Sorry about that. Can you all hear me again? Oh, hello. <laughs> yeah. We, okay. Yeah. I apologize. That's, I had a bad connection. I apologize. So as I was saying, you have a clear disconnect between the claims of public safety and the actual needs for safety in the community. And the irony of this is that schools all over the country are looking to you, Chicago as the model for how to play out their own public safety units. So when Johns Hopkins was going through a crime spike in 2019, they sent their administration to Hyde Park to study and use UChicago as a model. But residents and students in, in, in Baltimore also looked at Hyde Park and UChicago as a model, but not as a model of good, as a model for what not to do. <laughs> and so they occupied the administration building in Baltimore for over a week and a half to fight against the creation of a private police force. 
Um, and they saw that looking at you, Chicago and looking at police forces all over the country, that these police forces have become agents of gentrification. They become the hard power that sets the terms for um, how to act, how to present oneself in spaces before the university sends the soft power of campus buildings and their jurisdiction over community, over community blocks. And so when we take this story that I'm telling in its broadest sense, we look at the labor, the low-wage labor. We look at the land control. We look at the healthcare. The policing becomes the living front lines for controlling the wealth that gets concentrated on these campus blocks and directly to the detriment of surrounding campuses. Because if you don't know, as these schools are ramping up their research and development and engaging in private partnerships with private companies like Google, Microsoft, Eli Lilly, um, they're doing this business on campus buildings because even if it's for-profit research, if it takes place on campus buildings, that the, the money that might come from uh, 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 products or patents is covered by the university's tax exemption, property tax exemptions. So these partnerships are very beneficial to private companies. And then the prosperity that gets concentrated on these campuses is precisely extracted from the surrounding neighborhoods in the form of the property taxes that would normally go to things like public schools, snow and trash removal, infrastructural de development and maintenance. So there's a direct correlation here in relationship between the prosperity that's hoarded on these campuses and sometimes the disparity or, or, or the poverty that takes place in terms of the city budgets, the neighborhood budgets in the surrounding neighborhoods. These things are connected. And so in this book, I try to tell that broader story of the relationship between these ivory towers and their host communities. At the end of the book, I begin to talk about some solutions. How do we get out of this? How do we reimagine this framework? A lot of the story is driven by my experiences in Chicago. Activists that were able to fight after years of seeing violence ramp up in surrounding neighborhoods and you Chicago turn its back on that violence with the inability to create a trauma one uh, medical, cent medical center. It took Damian Turner in 2010 to be shot in Woodlawn and had to be sent eight miles to the medical center in Northwestern in downtown Chicago and dying on the uh, 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 on the operating table, where activists, students, residents engaged in a phenomenal campaign to push for a trauma one level center. Because right in their own backyard of Hyde Park and in Woodlawn, there's this beautiful medical center that was ramping up its services in the forms of cancer research and uh, um, um, uh, what do you call it, cosmetic surgery and other very profitable endeavors but wasn't serving the surrounding community. And if you don't know, uh, medical centers that are affiliated with universities are also tax exempt, but their tax exemption is predicated on offering indigent care to those of need. But medical centers like the one at the University of Chicago don't provide indigent care to the degree that they claim that they do. And they make it very difficult to find indigent care if you live in the surrounding neighborhoods. And it's a requirement, but they don't publicize that. So the activism that took place on the part of residents, students, alum, observers, faculty, finally pushed until uh, High Park Southside, now in 2018, began to have a trauma one uh, a medical care unit for gunshot victims and other um, severe service, se severe injuries. That's because of grassroots organizing, not because of the benevolence of the university that has hoarded this wealth, hoarded these things. They also pushed during the campaign because at the same time, the university was vulnerable because they wanted to capture the Obama Presidential Center. And one of the major chants during this campaign was no trauma, no Obama. And because uh, the campus was in the spotlight, this put the university on the front lines 
of people seeing the contradictions between ramping up boutique services at the medical center, the multi-million dollar push for an Obama presidential center, and the absence of a trauma one medical center that became the face of a range of realms of disparity as one looked around to the neighborhoods that surrounded the University of Chicago's main campus. So this became glaringly obvious. From this came the Community Benefits Coalition, that for years it would have been considered sacrilege for especially African-Americans to be critical of Barack Obama. But courageous activists and scholars and students got together, people from STOP and the Visible Institute and um, other people that were, that were mobilized from a couple of years earlier when there was the, um, the reparations commission surrounded by the police terrorism unit at um, Hyman Square. Activists had been ramped up by that and they've transferred that activism to this community benefits campaign against the Obama library. And they were able to push and push and they're still pushing for the Obama library um, to offer community benefits. But that would have been sacrilegious from years earlier to even think about critiquing, you know, who we call the community organizer, Barack Obama. Yet his name and his, his library was being used for many, what many people were saying was to ramp up gentrification in the woodlawn and surrounding neighborhoods of where the library was gonna sit. Number one, it wasn't gonna be put in Washington Park. It was being put on the other side of the highway so people could come in Con, you know, uh, consume the library and get out <laughs> from Lakeshore Drive and other areas. And people brought attention to that. And now there are campaigns to say, you know, if the library is going to be here, we've seen that there were speculators running down to the areas and housing prices have exploded, land bags have exploded with just simply the mention of the live of the presidential center coming to the to uh to uh to the area. Obama would get on uh, video feeds to say, you know, we have 20, 30 years before gentrification will come to these areas. They need this process, this development, this investment more than they need, you know, other things, community benefits. But history has proven him wrong. And so people are beginning to mobilize around uh, property tax relief, um, uh, affordable housing carve outs for any land that's going to be developed, that's being used, that's using public land or state land or state money. And so you begin to see a growing resistance to the unchecked encroachment of higher education in our daily lives in ways that probably would have been unimaginable five or 10 years previously. And this is a story against been national. You can see the same struggles happening um, between Carnegie Mellon, UPIT, and Pittsburgh. Between right now, there is a campaign to fight for um, uh, affordable housing in West Philadelphia as the university city townhouses are being demolished because there's so much prosperity surrounding um, uh, life science and pharmaceutical companies that want to work and be near the University of Pennsylvania. I'll be headed to university uh, to, uh, to Berkeley in a couple weeks because there's a campaign, there's a controversy right now where there was a lawsuit on the part of homeowners who had put together a, law a lawsuit to argue um, that unchecked enrollments um, in the city of Berkeley are having adverse effects on the infrastructure of the city. Now, the public story is that how dare these disgruntled rich homeowners use a lawsuit to get in the way of expanding public education. But residents in the city are using my work to say, yes, maybe the face of this lawsuit wasn't the best face. It's a couple of spoiled uh, white elite individuals. But if we get deeper than that, the fact that the University of California at Berkeley is increasing their enrollments, but they aren't producing affordable student housing. Only 25% of Berkeley students are actually housed on campus. And so when these students get pushed out into the city housing market, it's inflating land values and landlords are coming in and turning single family homes into what they're calling mini dorms. Individual rooms are being turned into individual um, uh, housing units, which is ramping up land values so that low-income and working-class families cannot afford to live in Berkeley. 
So this enroll, this in increased enrollment is not just about student access. It's about the university turning itself into a private developer to benefit its own wealth and its own endowments. And so these are the stories that I'm telling in the book. And recently with my Smart Cities Lab, I've been consulting and working with communities like in Berkeley, in West Philadelphia, um, in the state of Massachusetts to fight for payments in lieu of taxes. So to make, to figure out ways to make universities pay at least a, a portion of the taxes they don't pay because they're by state law tax exempt, even though they're generating so much wealth through their private partnerships. So I've been working with these groups all over the country, trying to figure out ways to create more equitable relationships between universities and their surrounding communities. So I'm gonna stop there. And I, I welcome any conversation, any questions, any comments. Um, and thank you again for your time. And Devarian, we've got, we'll start out. We have a couple of questions in the chat box. Yeah. So um, let me just start there. Um, this is a comment and a question. Um, the person that you interviewed at ASU at Arizona State University stated that their university was the most populous in the US. They are only the seventh most, you believe that the, oh, they are only the seventh most. You believe, do you believe that the pandemic has changed some of the thinking of the large universities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the interesting thing about the University of Air, uh, Arizona State University is that even before the pandemic, the U Arizona State University cannot leverage prestige like U Chicago or Yale or even my school of Trinity. So they can't leverage prestige and turn that into, into property value in the way that those least schools can. So what they have done is the exact opposite. They have tried to pack as many students as possible on their one of five campuses and turn them into a closed market for retailers, commercial developers. And so they, they, they're working in, they're dealing in, they've been dealing in volume for the last 10 years. That's been their approach. And part of that has been to go online even earlier than the pandemic. Now, when this book came out during the pandemic, many people thought that, oh, the argument that I'm making is going to be challenged because people aren't gonna find, people aren't, people aren't trying to move back into cities. But what we've actually found is that endowments for universities has sometimes doubled during the pandemic as money market accounts have, in, have skyrocketed. And so what's actually happening is that universities' land portfolios, the value has increased. And they are finding different ways to monetize this land um, that continues to have adverse effects on surrounding communities. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, during the pandemic, because of social protest, um, U Chicago was forced to begin uh, taking the, now if you, you probably all know this, every day universities throw out tons of food from the cafeterias because they can't use it again. So during the pandemic, um, they began to, University of Chicago began to package their, their food into healthy meals for communities of need that's around the campus. Now the question that I have is why haven't they been doing this all along? This is a perfect and easy example of how the wealth and prosperity of these institutions could be reparceled or reimagined in ways that could benefit surrounding communities instead of stealing from them through tax exemption, through uh, suppression of wages, through um, you know um, being not being forthcoming about the indigent care they're supposed to provide, through over policing the neighborhoods. This is one small way they could do different, do different, and do better. Um, and so you're seeing, um, especially after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the rise of divest, invest and police abolition movements, people are coming to me and other places are saying, you know, the policing thing is just the tip of the iceberg for the ways in which these universities are exploiting us and we need to push them to do better. So um, just during the pandemic, um, Yale, uh, activists in New Haven, Connecticut um, reached out to me. I know we have a New Haven resident here. Um, reached out to me, there were campaigns, there were rallies. Um, already Yale University, they provide the biggest pilot in the country at $14 million a year. But they have a $40 billion endowment. And that doesn't even include the value of the property. And they're the biggest property old, private property holder in the city of New Haven. 
So New Haven Rising is a 30 year old uh, political campaign that includes labor activists, students, community members, local politicians. They brought me in to write op-eds to join their protest movements and their rallies. And they were able during the pandemic to push Yale University to contribute an additional $10 million a year over the next five years for property tax relief because they don't pay property taxes. Now, one can make it very clear that $10 million a year for the next five years is peanuts compared to a $40 billion endowment. That's very true. But the precedent that that campaign set is that when the school offered the $10 million, they said that that money was for tax relief. So it sets the precedent of a school finally acknowledging that they have a responsibility for the taxes they aren't paying and that these monies that they give out are not just benevolent gifts of philanthropy or goodwill. So schools and towns are trying to build on the precedent set by this campaign in New Haven. And you're starting to also see, as I said before, with, AS, with, with uh, University of California, Berkeley, you're starting to also see public schools beginning to think differently about how the designation of being a public university and using the shield of serving the public good so it can sometimes be a cover for hoarding wealth on these campuses. I mean, Arizona State University, they lease out their land to private companies. The biggest private development in the state of Arizona, a regional headquarters for State Farm Insurance, is cited on Arizona State land, and they don't pay property taxes. So, so, so cities are starting to see that. And like my work with Berkeley right now, people are starting to see the, 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 the multiple adverse effects this is having, even after the pandemic. So that was a long answer, but I just wanted to get you to understand the larger context. So thanks for the question. Well, I have a comment to make, um, and this is an observation as a longtime Hyde Parker, at least since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about the University of Chicago and their um, trauma center. Yeah. And um, I would argue that before they agreed to build the trauma center, mm -hmm. their emergency room in Hyde Park was an embarrassment to themselves right. and the community. Right. Um, the wait times were awful. Mm -hmm. The conditions were terrible. Right. Um, it was uh, staffed by police. Mm. Uh, and after this movement to, to get a class one trauma center, we shifted attention away from the primary emergency room to the trauma center, which mm. may or may not be doing a good job, but the emergency room still stinks. <laughs> Their wait times are up to eight hours mm. for people walking in. Uh, so I think the university has very cleverly masked uh, giving us a trauma center right. and still not improving our ordinary emergency room service. So I think that is a part and parcel of what you've been talking about is that it, for them, it's, it's a visual, it's a, yeah. uh, what done a they can do analysis. show that, exactly. <laughs> Whereas the underlying situation has not changed a bit. The right. emergency room is still awful. Mm -hmm. as a couple of my friends can attest to. Um, but we have a class one trauma center, right. which is supposed to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. But has it improved the quality of life around here? I'm not sure, except for maybe a few gunshot victims, which, that's right. uh, yes, add, that's an important to, thing. And to add but insult to in injury, the violence goes beyond just simply the lack of trauma care. Um, after decades of divesting in communities like Woodlawn, um, in about three to four years, there will be more students in Woodlawn from U Chicago than there will be in High Park. Mm -hmm. So this expansion of the campus and its buildings and the police, because they follow wherever there's a U Chicago building, um, it's changing that you're living in a militarized zone. And so then when there's a... a you know, a, a gunshot victim, like there was, and it's a tragic story of what recently happened twice. Um, but it raises other issues that 
in some of these cases, these are individuals. Now, in the case of the uh, Asian American, the Asian student getting shot, that was a a, a, a crime of, of poverty. And then the other gunshot victim was somebody who was going through a mental health uh, a crisis, and the response has been uh, has been armed. And so, what does it mean to live in an environment where issues and problems are solved at the bear at the end of a barrel of a gun? Exactly. And and then you don't have a good emergency center. So this this is a compounded phenomenon. And, and my belief, and, and you know, people walk away from sometimes from from this work reading the book. Well, is he anti-university? And, and no, I am not. The point that I'm making is that the university has these amazing resources. That in the world we talk about decriminalization, we talk about divest, invest. If there is any institution that could engage in non-carceral, non-violent approaches to public safety, it's higher education. What, wouldn't it mean something if instead of sending out armies of police, that you sent out armies of professional healthcare workers to offer wellness checks, trauma care, food security, housing security. Wouldn't it mean something if these universities with their massive resources and wealth, they study these things, but they don't offer solutions for these issues in their own backyards. So I'm asking for the universities to live up to the best of their mission and not the least of their mission. I think sometimes that, you know, as far as the policing is concerned, uh, the city police aren't very nice either. Right. So it's, dif it's difficult to say, oh, look at the U of Chicago. You know, it, right. if they didn't have their name written on the door, would you know the difference? Mm -hmm. No, it's true. I mean, I think that the, the, irony, the hard part is that the U Chicago police are a private security force with public power and jurisdiction. Yes, I hear you, but I'm saying, are they... Are they actually behaving worse than the unit than the city of Chicago police? Not to no. say that I I don't want them to behave badly. I'm just saying yes. it's hard to pressure for them to clean up their act when when the people they're taking over for are for are bad too. Teenagers and alleys, you know. Nope, you're right. My and, only and my Jean, only Jean, I would I would say because uh, I live right on Lakeshore Drive, right here in the middle of Hyde Park. Yeah, there is no difference between the city police and the University of Chicago police. There is no difference. I, they I kind of arrive did too. They I arrive for calls at the same time. They they are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So there's I, no. I live, yeah, I live on Ingleside, which is in West Hyde Park, considered to be D Class A. You know, and we have both kinds of cop cars rolling up and down the street, and they are forever stopping and bothering black teenagers. Mm -hmm. That is all they do on our block. I mean, I guess because there's not much else going on on our block, but teenagers hanging out mm -hmm. and right. they don't do anything, but the cops are always stopping them. Mm -hmm. And I don't see the difference between the two organizations either. Yeah. You know? And so I'm, that makes it hard to change. Uh, but the, right. the, 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 I, I the, see, the it would be well, nice. I see Nina. Nina there. has her hand up. Nina, would you unmute yourself? Good idea. Um, I just wanted to add to that. I'm not sure I know how to talk about this, but I have been made aware of um, connections between the city police and the University of Chicago where there, for example, um, agreements that information about rapes or other kinds of things that can go on won't get publicized. I dealt with that personally 40 years ago. Mm. And the university, I wanted people to know I was attacked in my own home in my sleep. And I wanted people to know that there were, and I learned that that had happened to four other people in a short area around me. And I, I wanted something that, like in the Herald, you know, I wanted people to know that this was going on so they could protect themselves. And the, the guy had an MO and it was all 
it was easy to identify and they wouldn't do it. The university wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I had been asked by a TV reporter to come and talk about my experience. She wanted, she wanted the word to get out. And I really didn't want to do that. And what I said was, I will do it if there's no other way to get the word out. And um, eventually, I mean, that did happen, but it was, it was wrong. And I, I felt that, you know, and this is my school. I have a love-hate relationship with it <laughs> because I went through lab school, U High, the university. I got a master's and a PhD there. And, and, the, and they didn't care if their students or members in the community were being protected as much as they cared about getting students and, and their reputation in the country. I think that was much more important to them than the safety of a person. So that was, now I talk, I've talked a lot with a lot of people about this and we did, we got some things to change. Mm -hmm but maybe not as much as they should. But I, I just, I did learn that as soon as I was able to talk to people at the university, and I have a big mouth, I guess I'm doing that right now, so I'm sorry, but no, I talk I talk to everybody. I'm, I'm not embarrassed about having been raped because that's a crime. I didn't cause it. <laughs> so I didn't mind telling everybody about it. And Hannah Gray, who was president at the time, started getting letters from people in the community that she didn't want to hear this kind of thing from. And then I got the story in the Herald. But it took a lot. <laughs> so that's all. I just, I, I'm, I'm distrustful of that because it happened then and I see now the same thing that you talked about which is that um, things are controlled very much there's a lot of control over things that happen and that don't happen in this community thank you Thank you. Thank you so much in, for sharing. In, in so you. many ways, I want to thank you for talking about what I have seen in my life here happen. I I believe what I know what you're saying is true, and people don't talk the way you do about it very much. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to hear it. I will say one more quick thing. I was a, a graduate in the class of 1964 in the college. And my class, there were two people in my class, two guys who figured out that the university had a lot of property and they weren't renting to black people. Right, right. And right. one of those people was um, Bruce Rappaport and the other was Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, yep. <laughs> and we mm. got a whole thing going. And yep. And it was a big deal. But so that's part of our history here. And I don't forget it. And none of us should. And well, there was a whole social movement around that. So I thank you so much for bringing that up. Yeah. And um, I think Mr. Marlin, he made the comment. I appreciate the comment where he says that um, he argued that I'm um, um, offering subjective experiences and that I'm only focusing on negative stories. And I want his response to that. I appreciate that observation. I, I want to acknowledge that universities do amazing things. They bring people together and they produce amazing innovations. So there's no question about that. But these are not subjective experiences. When I began talking about these things and I had university administrators reaching out to me under anonymity to confirm that the things that I was saying were factual and that they were policy, um, that, that confirmed to me what I was saying was true. And when I look at the clear disparity until the trauma center came online between the levels of indigent care that, that, that community hospitals were being shut down by the university and boutique services were being ramped up, 
that's an institutional decision. That's not a subjective experience. And then when we look at the clear disparities in the numbers of African-Americans that live in Hyde Park compared to the numbers of African-Americans that are stopped, questioned and arrested by UCPD, those, that's, those are not subjective experiences. That is statistical data. No, I'm no, sorry, but I'm sorry that you didn't, no, sir. Sir, be, let me, no, let me tell you. Way, I, I want to interrupt you. Can I just finish my statement? Let me just finish real quick. I don't, I don't wish it to be that way. I wish it was a different way. And, and uh, I, believe, right, I and think I believe, you misunderstood, I believe, sir. Yeah, I don't, you, would you let me get in, please? I was referring to the emergency room and not all these other things. I referred to all the negative activities. I'm well aware of the university being biased as far as their policing. Are you well aware that the university uh, backed up restrictive covenants on housing for decades, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I know all, of, I know about that. I was referring to the comment I said, I had good experience in the U of C E R. That's what I was talking about subjectivity, not all the rest of the things you were saying. But mm -hmm. I do think you did not emphasize and your approach doesn't emphasize all the kind of things that universities in general do for communities. There are lots of people there. There are students there. They, they purchase things at local stores. They help the local economy. They offer cultural activities. They have plays and dramas and they have all kinds of things that people in the community can do. That doesn't obviate the rest of the things. Right. Uh, what I think what I was referring to is I have had good experiences in the emergency room and how long people wait there. There are all kinds of variable factors that, that, uh, that have to do with how long people wait. Is yeah. it Saturday night? Is it other times? What kind of traumas happen? What kind of emergencies happen? How many people are on staff? There are a multitude of variables and they triage people. So some people do have to wait. It's unfortunate. But sir, I just want to I don't think every, that, but I don't think we should decide those on the basis those, those, on the basis of, of two people have who waited eight hours that it's a no, terrible but, emergency. Yes, sir, that but wasn't, you that wasn't my that wasn't my argument. Oh, and that's not oh, what I'm oh, arguing sorry. in the book. Let me just let me can I just get in for a minute. That yeah. that wasn't my argument. That's not a point that I made in my book. Those were observations that were made in this conversation. So perhaps those, those statements should be, should be directed towards your colleagues in the book club and not to me, because I didn't make that statement. That was a statement made by your colleagues. I know, I understand that, but I, that's what I was pointing out to it. I think that I, I, I didn't say that you were saying that. Okay. I, maybe I didn't make that clear enough. That's I, fine. And I, and I, but I, I, appreciate I was referring point. to what was said in the conversation yeah. about reporting okay. of people uh, experiences in the uh, in the okay. emergency room, not that it had to do with your book. Sorry, yeah, and I appreciate okay. that. All right. Thank that, you. And I and I think excuse me, but I think you have to also look at it in terms of. Um, I think there is a there's unfortunately in Hyde Park there is an ethnicity issue that that deals with it. I think there is, um, you know, sort of, there, there, there's a lot of issues. So I, I can only speak to my late husband and his experience at, at the ED at the University of Chicago and him going there, waiting eight hours, coming home, and then me and my sister having to drive him to advocate on it's a basically Illinois Masonic to be taken care of because he had he had very bad treatment in the e ED when he walked in as an African American male versus the time that we called an ambulance and him being taken in. So I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a very interesting dichotomy of how people get treated based on their ethnicity, based on how they come into there and what people see because my, you know, he walked in there so they didn't see him as an acute patient, but the reality is he had a blood clot that broke off in his leg and lodged in his lung. 
Oh. And he should not have been sitting for eight hours in the waiting room in, yeah. at the university, but he did. And then we landed up taking him somewhere else. But when he was brought in by ambulance, he was taken care of for something else. So, you know, it, it's, it, you don't know, is it okay. the person who's at the desk? Is it the way somebody presents? Is it their ethnicity? There, there's a lot of variables mm. that go into what happens when somebody walks into an ED and how they're treated, mm. you know? Um, so I, I would have, yeah. I would have to say here, I would, I would like to say here as sort of a pseudo moderator that we have obviously hit on a very hot spot in this community. Uh, my only point in my comment was that I did not think that the university had substantially changed their treatment yeah. or, or their system. Now I noticed that uh, Chet Reft has had his hand up for quite a while, so I'm going to And we've got a couple other questions a, in the chat too. Yeah. We have a couple other yes. questions in the chat. Yes. Right, but I have noticed that Chet has had his hand up for a while. So Chet. Yeah, I had two comments I'd like you to respond to. First of all, I don't think in your book you mentioned in the 70s, there was a serious effort that the University of Chicago was going to move out of Hyde Park. Mm. There was a lot of effort put into that and they decided and that was one of the reasons they beefed up the police force, supposedly. Right. The other comment I had is to say something positive about the hospitals that they uh, we had a Zoom meeting in which the university in the hospital, uh, particularly in the trauma center, has put together a group. People have come in that have been shot and think they have social services now. They work constantly with these people. They try to get them jobs and they try to get them some housing to try to work. I mean, it's a small program, but they said yeah. they're trying to increase that to try to give these people that come in here, they have all kinds of problems uh, to try to improve their life. Yep. And I, you know what? And there are, there are a number of examples of cases like this. And in the back of my book, when I talk about solutions, I point to cases like this. And my, my ultimate point here is that to identify the way we've been living with these institutions and to acknowledge all of the amazing resources and potential that they have and to figure out ways how to optimize those resources and potential, the research, the personnel, the contacts, the networks. So the ultimate goal here is to, is to, is to push and to endorse and to encourage institutions to live up to their claims and their potential. I hope that's what we all want. And that's definitely what I'm fighting for. With my Smart Cities Lab, I'm working with universities all over the country to allow them, to push them, to encourage them, to live up to their, to their, to their missions. And I think that that example, the case you're mentioning with the trauma center and the uh, job referral program and job training is precisely the kind of work that we should be seeing more of. And that's important. Hey, Dottie, yeah. Dottie could you um, summarize or at least uh, so, try to yeah, Devarian, I'm gonna give address you, the chat issues? Yeah, these are two different questions and you can address them obviously one at a time. But sure. One is, um, do you take a look at how boards of trustees are packed with billionaires? And case in point, the new uh, president of the board of the University of Chicago, right. Mr. Rubenstein. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is, just a minute. Um, oh. Just a second. I just have to scroll up. Mm. Okay, just a minute. Um, how widespread is the practice of outsourcing employment? Yeah. U the university seems willing to pay large amounts to agencies who employ, quote unquote, traveling nurses and agencies who employ security guards rather than pay local people and living wages. So we got the board and then we got the outsourcing of employment. No, that's those are two great questions. And I'll be very brief on the uh, board issue. I don't focus on that, but I talk about, especially in New York City, where I spend a lot of time on this. It's it's not iron it's not a, a an irony that the the NYU and Columbia's board of trustees are packed with um, construction moguls, real estate I tycoons, and other individuals, and they direct the interests of university development. Like that's not a mistake. That's totally connected. So I'll say that real quickly to that. Okay. Um, as far as outsourcing and subcontracting, that's become a significantly powerful response that universities have have uh, have developed and deployed in response to the growing strike waves that have run, that have gone over uh, higher education labor forces, that as university workers have begun to organize and to organize labor 
the response by universities is to is to increase or ramp up their subcontracting of security, of nurses, aides, of um, cafeteria workers. And you're seeing that all over the country, that they're allowing, they're celebrating that they're being open to uh, labor organizing while they're shifting more and more of their workforce to subcontracted, non-unionized, um, unprotected labor. So, that, that, so those are my answers to both those questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and just one thing, I was, I was um, really struck by, I mean, I, I think of the University of Chicago just sitting you know, on top of the, the mountain, but how much that they look to what's going on in other campuses and how competitive they feel. Yeah. I, I'm sure, particularly with the, at the undergraduate level. Well, it's amazing you mentioned that because UChicago has been a leader in kind of urban renewal and gentrification for other schools all over the country since the 1950s. <laughs> so when the, and so some of you, some of you probably lived through this, but in the 1960s, when we begin to see urban renewal wash over many cities, people don't know enough about how universities got together and created a lobbying group and lobbied the federal government to create an amendment to the Housing Act of 1949 that was called the 112 Credits Program in 1959 that allowed them to get for any urban renewal project in a city that was affiliated with the university. For every dollar the city spent on that project, the federal government would donate $2 and so universities became the friendly face of urban renewal and U Chicago was the leader of that lobbying group that included NYU, uh, Columbia, UPenn, U uh, University of California, Berkeley, University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, they were the leader of that lobbying group. And the very same neighborhoods that are now sites of university renewal and prosperity were those very same blocks that were displayed, where black and brown folk were displaced from 60 years earlier. And so just to speak to that story, there are, there are direct lines between the role of higher education administrators and current development projects going on today. Wow, fascinating. Um, Jean Jenkins, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I, let me make a comment on urban renewal, but that's not my real comment. I moved here in 68. And I had friends who had lived here for, you know, a couple, you know, 15, 20 years before that. And they talked all the time about the urban renewal because they talked about how Lake Park and 55th Street were these really vibrant business communities with mm -hmm. comedy clubs and restaurants and everything in the world. And when I moved in, they were just barren. I mean, yep. 55th Street was like a wasteland. There's right. stuff been built since, but it's still very barren compared to other streets in the area. So, and it was really the wanted, lake was specifically targeted. It was a it was a, a thriving kind of black middle class area, and there yeah. was no, there was no blight, there was no need for demolition. But because it had black residents, you Chicago targeted that area for demolition. Right, because they want they wanted to make sure that you know young white kids from Iowa, their parents would send them here. Right. So they wouldn't be afraid. I I mean I lived across the hallway from. A young married couple who talked about that, that, you know, they they had to beg to get to be allowed to come here because they knew their parents knew they were going to be murdered in their beds, <laughs> uh, yeah. which since they kept leaving their door unlocked, they almost were, I suppose. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, what I wanted to ask was about tax. Now, the tax, the fact that they have no taxes, that's a state decision. Is that right? That's yeah. right. Well, because so, every state designates makes high, uh, nonprofits as property tax exempt. Okay, so it's the 501c3s. state. Five hundred one c three. Yeah, it's the state that gives them this privilege, but it's the the city that you know has to pay for the privilege. It is it, you That's know. Right. So this is this is a problem. I mean, the city can't say, "Well, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do something to you," right? Because you've got it from the state. You know. You know. That's that's a little. That's a way in which the states impoverish the cities and you can't do anything about it or yes. I, I say it back you, you can do something about anything but you can't do it quickly Ruth yeah. do you Ruth do you have your hand up no 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 nope. yeah and I and I agree with Maureen that in California um the very same homeowners that put forward the lawsuit um against against en enrollment increases would not be for low-income and working-class housing but what the lawsuit did is that it put a spotlight 
on the, the lack of power that anybody has to push back against university expansion, especially a state university. So I think you're right. The people who, it, it was an unfortunate uh, face of the, of the lawsuit, but it put a spotlight on a larger problem about higher education autonomy when it comes to their role in private development. And their role in taxes. Their role in to respond, right. Yeah. They're on taxes. And they've also, in their new developments, they have um, created contracts with private um, uh, uh, staffing companies as a way to bypass uh, unionized labor on the campus because the uh, cure, uh, uh, custodial staff and the, and the cafeteria staff are highly unionized in California. And so as they buy up, they own like 50%, they're the biggest landholder in the state of California. And as they put new developments on this land, they make sure that the labor is not unionized as a way to undermine that power. So these are the unintended, these are the un, un, unspoken consequences, even though it's been controversial to have these selfish NIMBY homeowners be the face of this lawsuit. You're right. Judy Suhu, do you have a question? Uh, I have a, a couple of comments and a question, please. Yeah, um, I, uh, your, your little passage about Brandy uh, Parker, I believe. Yes. That, that was so heartbreaking for me mm. to hear that he found solace and safety on campus, yet he was seen as a threat. So just a comment there. And then um, also, uh, I didn't know what happened to Theaster Gates. I thought what he was doing was great. And I, it was disappointing to, to see that he's, you know, working in Maine now. Um, and then um, I, I totally, uh, I totally really got into your book. I really appreciated it. Um, uh, my personal story, I, I was uh, alumni. I'm an alumni there eons ago. And uh, when I went to UC, it was kind of known that you don't go past the midway, right. okay? And you stayed on campus to be safe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then my son went uh, to UC just the uh, last uh, few years and nothing's changed. He, he went to the dorm on 61st Street, one of the new dorms. Ah, and, yeah. and I was like, when I heard that, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, you know? And he said, what's your problem? You know, essentially. But um, it was sad to know that nothing's really changed. Maybe even has gotten worse. And I totally, I totally agree with your, I, with your concept that this is a, a learning institution. It's 130 something years old. And if we, you know, where do we go to try and learn and to understand if not, you know, higher education. Mm -hmm. And I also, um, uh, when I was reading, I couldn't help but liken it to my experience in corporate America. I work mm -hmm. for a very large company mm -hmm. and how insular, they, how insular they are and totally not engaged with the community. That was back in the telecom days, the big okay. telecoms where they were laying sure. off yeah. you know, thousands of people, not understanding that they're laying off customers. They're laying off people who work in their community where you know, the buildings stood. So I, I wonder, you know, this is supposed to be an institution of higher learning. Uh, you know, is it the vision? What are the, the different variables? Could it be that if you run such a big organization, you need to start thinking of it as a business, you know, or, you know, or is it, you know, as simple as that? Or is it that, you know, the intention, there is, there, there's racism or, or whatever, you know, I'm just kind of curious about, about that. It's a great Thank question. Um, first, I want to point out is that there are many universities on the same campus. So it's very difficult to say the university. So I appreciate that. But there are times when these various universities do converge. And in the story that you read that I tell in the Chicago story is the moment where the Office of Community Engagement and the real estate department get put together in the same mm -hmm. unit. Yes. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Or the moments, and I remember this on the outside. When I first started talking to you, Chicago, I would pose, I sent questions to Theaster Gates. And he directed them to the communications office. And they had to vet them. So this sounds like, talk about corporate America. They had to vet them and then send them back to me with answers, not from him, but from them. Now that I know Theaster, and I know that he was trying to maneuver within this gauntlet, now I know what he was dealing with. 
Um, he was trying to play one side off the other. He's kind of a trickster. Uh, but he failed. And he, he and he's finding solace now in Maine because it didn't work. Uh, because the university was too powerful and its its mission was too strong. Uh, and so just to answer your question about what is the motive, what is the mo motivation, you know, I don't even think it's necessarily inherently racist, racism. I think it's the university seizing on the ways in which um, race and racism are aligned with low economic value. And so by living in neighborhoods that are black and brown, it makes it easier for them to exploit those neighborhoods in terms of buying up properties, um, taking advantage of low wage workers who have fewer places to, to work, um, that the, the racial and economic com co conditions are con combined and the university takes advantage of that. What bothers me is when the very same institutions put out these statements about diversity, equity, and inclusion <laughs> after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and yet they exploit the black and brown neighborhoods where they sit and the black and brown workers who work low wage work jobs on their campuses. And so my statement to them is that if you're gonna talk about DEI, offer living wages, offer housing, offer food service programs, that would be the greatest, I guess, examples of true DEI more so or equal to diversifying your curriculum offerings and diversifying your faculty ranks. Do differently with the communities of color that host you. Thank you. Could I just add um, uh, with regard to what Nina Halstein was talking about? Uh, as I mentioned that I have a, my son just graduated, he was class of 2020, but he went through middle school and high school at USC. And I can tell you that things, oops, oh my God. Oh, oh, I just, I just got kicked out. No, we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I lost my, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I can tell you that things really haven't changed because I had heard about a couple of incidences of sexual harassment, um, I believe it was in, in high school. And as a parent, I was trying to understand what was going on and I could not get any information. And I think uh, it was quote resolved because they said that the, uh, it, it was a, a male uh, that he was put on um, uh, probation or something for a couple of days, you know, and that was it. But it, there was no, uh, yeah, you know, just to let you know that yeah. things haven't changed. Yeah. And just to confirm, this is, this is a question about brand management that, you know, those who are seen as inside and a part of the institution, there's a, there's a, um, a reticence to publicize criminal activities. Right. But sure. there is a, a, a motivation to publicize criminal activities outside, in the areas considered outside of the campus. As you, as you mentioned, Brandy Parker, he talked to me about being stopped three or four times a week, yeah. you know, um, to make the statement, you know, who is inside and who is outside of the campus community. And, and that was telling for me that even the university has such an impact on so many aspects of the lives of people who aren't even directly tied, who aren't directly employed by the institution itself. So that was a very powerful, um, realization for me. Any other questions right, or comments? I thank you all so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. But I, I think the administration of a university is exactly like the administration of a big corporation. They want to, you know, they want to help out their shareholders. You know, all the stuff we think about a university we're more thinking about the professors in the library and stuff like that. We're not thinking about those guys in Cobb Hall who go out and, you know, for the benefit of the board of trustees or whoever, it's, it's just like if they were IBM or Walmart or something like that, they're not, you know, they're not different. That's right. Yeah, in the book I talk about, we're still enamored, we're still overwhelmed by the myth of the schoolhouse. Oh yeah. We still think the primary job of higher education is to teach classes and to conduct pure research. Right. As, we, as we've entered the knowledge economy, these institutions have been, have been bestowed with the power of, the, of being the economic drivers of our entire economy. And with that, we are seeing the decrease of, of the educational side and the increase of the non-educational side in terms of tax transfer, real estate, 
development, foundation offices, the police department, these departments are, are ballooning. And the educational side is shrinking. And so the, my main point in this book is to draw attention to that new landscape. And no matter what you feel about it, when we're dealing with institutes of higher education, we have to deal with them as they actually are and not as we wish they would hope or we hope them to be. And that was the ultimate takeaway I hope to offer for this book. Thank you. Well, thank you to Varian. It, it's been um, a fascinating discussion for all of us. And I would just like uh, on behalf of the, the Hyde Park Historical Society and the Hyde Park Book Club to thank you all for joining us, especially to Varian. This has been really a wonderful discussion and very enlightening. I would just like to bring up a couple of upcoming book club meetings that we have. Um, April 18th, we have Bill Swislow, author of Lakefront Anonymous, Chicago's Unknown Art Gallery, which is the carvings up and down the lakefront, which are rapidly disappearing. Um, and hopefully sometime in May, he will be leading some live tours, but on April 18th, he will be discussing his book. Um, May 16th, 2022, we will have Don Turner, who is author of Three Girls from Bronzeville, a uniquely American memoir of race, fate, and sisterhood. She will be joining us um, for a Zoom session. Uh, and then it just goes on and on. Monday, June 20th, Chicago Beer, a history of brewing, public drinking, and the corner bar. This will be a live <laughs> a live session with June Sawyer. We aren't, uh, Sawyers, we aren't sure quite where that's gonna happen. We're hoping it's gonna happen at Jimmy's, but we have to make that arrangement. Um, July 18th, we have uh, Betty Heckman, who is the author of Murder, Inc., Writer for Hire, Mystery, which is uh, set in Hyde Park. Uh, so a, a little bit of fiction for us all, Monday, August 15th, Deborah Cohen, author of Last Call at Hotel Imperial, the reporters who took on a world at war, um, a World War II story. And finally, in September, we've got time for Frankie Coolen. We'll be joined by Bill Savage for the discussion. Of course, some of you know Bill Savage for his books on Chicago and uh, he's quite well known around here. So anyway, the book club is alive and well um, and thanks to Devarian, very much alive and well. We thank you again for joining us and um, I would like to thank you all for joining us and we will reconvene about a month from now. Thank you again. Thanks so much. Thank you, Devarian. That was great. Great. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Appreciate you. Great to have you with us. Bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Good night.